What is your take on the ratcheting up of U.S. action on Huawei while we are still waiting for the U.K. government to make a determine about whether, determination about whether to use Huawei in its networks at all? Hi, Emily. You know, th this, the geopolitical underpinnings of 5G are, are pretty interesting. The reality is, is the U.S. government feels that some companies in China, because of the uh, you know, strong leadership or ability to influence these companies and what they do, potentially could create problems in some of the hardware that, that they provide. So, I mean, this is, this is a, a dialogue that's really been going on with Huawei since 2012 and the House Intel Committee report related to it. So, this is just a natural continuation. Uh, underneath all this, you have the, the, the larger issue of the dynamic between the U.S. and China and, and, and who's going to control and create, you know, have the most influence on information in the future. And 5G is central to that. And it really is the next generation of the, of the Industrial Revolution, or as some call the fourth generation of the Industrial Revolution. Deborah, is the U.S. government making the right calls on Huawei, given the importance of the future of 5G? Yeah, and I think um, incredibly well said that, you know, when we look at 5G, it is the combination of industry and automation. And when you think ahead of all the types of data, all the different ways that we could be looking at the information that's coming in, it's billions and trillions amount of information, whether that's through facial recognition, video, technology, artificial intelligence, just the sheer amount of data definitely you're going to have to have a harder look at the types of cyber activity that's occurring and the threats that may be occurring around that data. Now, Mark, let's talk a little bit about 5G in general and where, if not Huawei, the market will be concentrated. If not Huawei, what are the companies that will be running 5G networks? Whose equipment will be embedded in these networks around the world? Yeah, Emily, that's a great question, and I think it's somewhat misunderstood. There are really three kind of end-to-end -end uh, hardware or infrastructure telecom providers. Huawei, Ericsson, and Nokia that can do kind of end-to-end. -end. But we then have a bunch of device manufacturers, and we also have all sorts of other players. For example, a lot of the, the, chip that go, the chips that go inside these networks are U.S. company Qualcomm. So really, if you go away from Huawei as the kind of the core provider, a lot of it would either be Nokia or Ericsson, potentially a combination of others. But what's really important here is is you know what 5G brings us. I mean, this is a huge change. Deborah alluded to some of this. I mean, we're going to be able to enable robotics. We're taking data that had been centrally kind of managed in the in the earlier generations of the uh, the internet, and we're spreading it out to the edge. And there's going to be a, a lot more related to security associated with that, and also opportunity around security. So. I mean, this is really going to change the way that we operate business and we as humans operate. Much like 10 years ago when we had the advent of 4G, we really didn't realize we were, what smartphones were going to be like. We're going to have similar things here. So I think this is, there are plenty of providers. Uh, I think the market will rationalize itself in many ways. But it's interesting to note that primarily these are offshore providers. The U.S. doesn't really have a major player in that core back end. But we do have the key telecommunication companies and many other players in, 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 in this business as well. Meantime, Deborah, as the world becomes more connected as we move towards 5G, whoever's equipment is running it, there's a huge gap, talent gap, in cybersecurity, how big is that gap and what's being done to fill it? I mean, the gap just continues to get larger. I mean, as was mentioned, the ideas when you think about supply chain, third party risk management, we no longer have to look at just cyber inside the four walls. Cyber truly is everywhere. It's in everything we do every day. It's in the business, it's in our organization's missions. It's everything that we do. And so when you think about the cyber workforce and the talent and where we're gonna to have to look to source individuals to help us solve these problems and these challenges, we have to start looking broadly and creating new ecosystems, looking at K through 12 programs, looking at how to align with universities and joint venture and venture capitalist organizations to really try to find and identify new and distinct ways to really be quite disciplined in the way that we look at finding these workforce. Now, Mark, what direction do you think we're going? I mean, obviously, the U.S. is cutting off Huawei. That could mean China will cut off U.S. and, and foreign suppliers as well. We're seeing moves by Russia to create a sovereign Internet. Is that the trend? Isolationism, at least digital isolationism, globally over the next decade? Well, let's not confuse the prism of, of 2019 with where we may be in four or five years, Emily. I think that's critical to understand. 
I mean, ultimately, we all, we've created a global internet, and, and we will always have these connect points regardless of who provides what capabilities. And security is really, fo is really about the data. Deborah talked about the types of things, facial resonance. It's really about protecting the data. That's what we do today in 4G. So we're going to go, th you know, there will ultimately be resolutions from a standpoint of where we can work with the various architectures and infrastructures. But the security opportunity around, around 5G is also great. The it is a huge opportunity, which is why you see companies like CrowdStrike, which you had on, you know, going up so much on their first day of an IPO. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of business opportunity. I think someone estimated something along the lines of 20, $22 trillion worth of, of impact globally in the next 15 years. I mean, this is a significant right. move. Yep. So we've got to, we've, you know, we've got to, we'll figure all this out, I'm confident.